Achieve your future self with magic internet money. But then I know a guy, um, Matt Luago, I think that's his name. He's trying to make make or die work on Bitcoin and he's doing it with wrapped Bitcoin. Do you have any thoughts on if this came to Bitcoin? I mean, I know that's a bit of cognitive dissonance because people tell me all the time, like, if this was on Bitcoin or a side chain of Bitcoin, you'd love it. You'd be talking about it all the time. And I'm like, yeah, I probably would. I probably would mention it the same way I'd mention Liquid or Tether. It's more like Liquid or what's that, that one Diego's working on? RSK. Yeah, Rootstock. Yeah, it's like one of those projects. I mean, I might mention it, be like, oh, this is good for Bitcoin, but I wouldn't be shilling it like, oh, you guys got to get this. Die token because it's on Bitcoin. It's a stablecoin of Bitcoin. Like I don't shill tethers. It's the same way. Like I think that de- tether is an interesting traders tool, but I don't get my friends, so people in South American countries, to start using tether for their daily currency. Yeah. Well, Matt is a great guy, but I think what he's trying to do is maybe slightly the opposite of that. Is trying to make Bitcoin usable in a trust minimized way on Ethereum, and then you can use that with existing Ethereum applications, for example, MakerDAO. That's valid too, except it has the same problems. Because they have TBTC as well. And it's not just wrapped Bitcoin. There's wrapped Bitcoin, which is like the BitGo's project and Republic Network and one of these other ICOs. I can't remember. There's two ICOs that made wrapped Bitcoin plus BitGo. And then there's TBTC. Do you know? I don't really know much about that one. Do you know what that one is? Yeah. So that's Matt's thing. Pretty similarly, you put some collateral down, I think it's ETH collateral, if I remember correctly, and you use that to generate synthetic Bitcoins. I don't think actually it's live yet. I I don't believe it's live yet. I think it's like in development still. I think it's going to be maybe in a couple of months live. Probably, yeah. Shouldn't be far, yeah. So it's basically, it's like another ERC-20 Bitcoin. Yeah, and, and unlike WBTC, it's supposed to be trust minimized. But again, it's going to have the same problems as Maker has pretty much. The thing is that any any project can pick and choose the trade-offs that they have, and they don't all select the same trade-offs. But in the end of the day, just because of the nature of how this works, there's going to be some centralized. Right. So anything that's adding Bitcoin to another blockchain is most likely going to have some kind of on-ramp or something that you're going to need to trust somebody. Yeah. Can you think of any ways to do it? And that's true for Liquid and RSK too, by the way. That's not an Ethereum problem. That's true for Liquid too. That's true for RSK too. That's true everywhere. So for Liquid, for people who don't know that are listening to what, like what's Liquid? Liquid is the project that Blockstream, one of the lead funders of the Bitcoin coders, the company Blockstream, they built a side chain for Bitcoin called Liquid Network, and then they open sourced it. I think it's Elements is the... Yeah, that's the open source version, yeah. Is the open source version. And it allows for more private, I think it uses... uh, They call it confidential transactions. Confidential transactions. It's a way to hide the amounts. Is that ring signatures? Uh, Nope. Okay, so confidential transactions is different. Yeah, Monero does use confidential transactions, but it also uses ring signatures and Liquid does not. So Liquid is the side chain that the Blockstream built. Blockstream also built the satellite, the Bitcoin satellite that allows you to use Bitcoin without the internet. And they launched these satellite modules into space, I guess, or into the atmosphere or something that beams the blockchain down to all the different countries. Another interesting science project. Not sure how scalable it is, but it's cool to have. But Blockstream built Liquid as a side chain to Bitcoin. And initially, a lot of Bitcoiners were saying things like, why didn't Vitalik build Ethereum as a side chain of Bitcoin? He could have done that. And well, then there's the human greed factor that, and the incentive factor there that people want to print their own money. They want to make their own tokens and get rich. And they could have done this as side chains to Bitcoin, where their transactions peg into Bitcoin blocks and Bitcoin is used as the like main security layer for all these other things. As far as I understand, it could work, like Ethereum could have worked as a sidechain of Bitcoin. Mm, I'm not sure. Well, so explain how would Ethereum work as a sidechain of Bitcoin and how wouldn't it work as a sidechain of Bitcoin? Right. So I guess when Blockstream started, they had this white paper on how sidechains would work. That was many years ago. And the way sidechains work today has pretty much nothing to do with what they described then. What was described then was a way to, again, do it in a kind of trust-minimized way, which would have required a soft fork to Bitcoin that was never even seriously considered. 
and also would put a lot of trust in miners. So miners would, they would effectively hold sort of the keys to spend or the permission to spend the sidechain funds. And they would basically vote by mining on who gets the funds. So, you know, if you would have funds on the sidechain, then it would kind of have like SPV level security where the miners could basically steal funds from you, you know, if a majority decides to do that. So that was the way that it was described originally. And that was the time at that time. Yeah, a lot of people said, why doesn't Ethereum use that and so on? But it never existed. It was always just a white paper. And there are many reasons why this wasn't advanced as the solution. One is that you know, Bitmain really grew to become a very large mining participant at the time. And people feared that it would just mean you would basically be giving the funds to Bitmain and they would get to decide if they're going to use it or not, if they're going to steal it or not, right? So that's not a very good idea. And also it required a soft fork, which it was at the time that we had the SegWit wars and it became apparent that it's not very easy to get soft forks through. There were many reasons why, but anyway, this model was completely abandoned. What they're using today is what they call a federated sidechain, which is very different, really. Basically what it means, there's a group of companies that just have this multi-sig address and you send Bitcoins to this multi-sig wallet. And when you do, they issue Bitcoins to you on this other separate chain and they manage the separate chain and whatever happens there you can verify whatever happens there you can move your funds on the side chain but eventually when someone wants to pull the funds out of the side chain then basically the operators of the federation have to release the funds from the multi-sig address on the mainnet on the bitcoin mainnet okay and they could either do that or not do that right they could choose to not do that so there's a risk there just like using MakerDAO, there's a risk that the federated nodes could turn against the users and just decide to keep the funds. Yeah. I mean, it's basically, it's very similar to just having your funds at an exchange. I mean, security-wise, it's almost the same as having your funds at an exchange. But instead of having one exchange controlling the funds, they have like a multi sig address between multiple exchanges. The risk is spread out a little bit more because it's not just Blockstream that controls Liquid. It's Blockstream plus Bitfinex plus... 20 other companies that are all federated node operators. Right. Not sure about the number, but yeah. Whereas right now, MakerDAO is just MakerDAO. So I believe it's kind of just MakerDAO and also just one of the VCs that holds a lot of the tokens because they don't need a lot of voting power. They don't actually need 50%. There's an article about why that is. The gist of it is they can use less than 50% to make changes. Is that Andreessen Horowitz? Yeah, I believe so. It kind of fluctuates how many percent of the MKR you would need to do this attack, but whatever, you know, it's not just the maker company. There are even others that could do that without the maker company cooperating. And remember that it could be a hacker too, right? It doesn't have to be the actual people who hold the keys. And also there's the Oracle thing, which is a different set of people. So there's all of these holes and they're separate holes. You can attack each one of them. So how many transactions fit in a Bitcoin block? It heavily depends on the transactions, right? But let's say probably 5,000. Okay, so I can't remember the number. Well, let's just say it's 5,000. How many transactions a second? Like four or something or seven? It's a very small amount of transactions per second that Bitcoin has. Right. So the idea of having Bitcoin be the settlement layer for side chains is to expand the to keep Bitcoin decentralized so that if you want to store your wealth in Bitcoin, there's decentralization above all else philosophy is intact. So you can still run a full node or if you want, you can still run a full node and verify everything and keep it from being centralized like other blockchains are being centralized. So the base layer always retains decentralization. Increasing the block size increases centralization risk. So keeping the base layer decentralized is kind of like the Bitcoin or ethos. Sidechains allows one of those transactions in the Bitcoin block to represent theoretically a million transactions on the sidechain. So it expands the capability to do lower risk transactions or higher risk transactions on a sidechain. So that's the way I'm looking at it. Like that's from the user perspective. Like there's 
altcoins, which make their own coins. And then it's kind of like a stock market thing where you can trade them and you're most likely not using them. You're just trying to get rich off this trade. But then there's the more useful, less money focused projects, which don't make their own coins. So the Ethereum ethos is like, do your ICO, make your own coin, and then we have more things to trade around and get rich off of. But I don't think they're motivated by that. I just think that became what to do. Yeah, I'm sure some of them are motivated by that, but I think a lot of them aren't. Actually, I take that back. I think the majority of the (laughs) developers that did that (laughs) were motivated by money. Yeah, but that's fine. That's fair. It's okay to be motivated by money, I think. But I mean, the thing is, again, just to be fair to Ethereum here, they really couldn't get the same properties by just using a Bitcoin sidechain. It would be something very different if they had. Well, we have rootstock, which is that way that you described it. So you described the risk of the miners colluding and then 51% of them, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, I can't remember, just colluding to just steal money in a side chain. Right, but that's a theoretical side chain that never came to be. But doesn't rootstock work like that? No, rootstock is a federated side chain just like liquid. It is? Because I thought I was talking to them like last year and the risk was still there that the miners could come together and steal coins. But I mean, there's game theory there that they wouldn't want to do that because then they get exposed as thieves. And So uh, I'm not even sure if we can exactly say that rootstock exactly exists per se. <laughs> <laughs> I know my portfolio losses exist. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a token. There's a token that went down quite a bit. Yeah, but other than that, I don't know if it actually qualifies into the category of existence exactly, but it's pretty much a federated sidechain. We do have like merged mining too, at least last time I checked, which was a long time ago. I'm not very updated on it, but I believe it's still federated. So Liquid is a federated sidechain, and you're saying Rootstock is also a federated sidechain. So the risk of the miners colluding is not really an attack vector at this moment to steal funds from either Rootstock or Liquid. Right. But the risk is that the operators of the multi-sig address just confiscate the funds. And really, you could say that it's a sidechain that enables more transactions, but really the thing to compare it to isn't Bitcoin. The thing to compare it to is an exchange. So, you know, you can deposit in the same way that you can deposit your Bitcoins to Liquid or Rootstock, you could deposit your Bitcoins to, God forbid, Coinbase, and then use the Coinbase interface to send Bitcoins to another user on Coinbase. Right. But I'm not talking about the money use case. I'm talking about all this other like blockchainery stuff that, you know, they're doing games and dApps and DeFi and all this. There could have been a way to build that type of a project as a sidechain of Bitcoin, but the risk profile... On Rootstock. Well, even on on Rootstock or Ethereum. Oh, yeah. Are you saying that the reason why Ethereum didn't get the properties or couldn't get the properties that they have now on Ethereum is because there's this federation of nodes? Yeah. But in that case, like decentralization doesn't matter for Ethereum anyways. Why? Well, because of the DAO hack and the... um, Oh, so yeah, that's sure. That's like they don't value like the Bitcoin ethos is decentralization above everything. But the Ethereum use case is if there's somebody that's going to hack the protocol, you know, use the smart contract in a way that they didn't agree. It's okay that we roll this back. And, you know, so their ethos is not decentralization. It's smart contracts and dApps and all that. Yeah, that's what you say. Obviously, they would not. No, they're not going to agree with that. (laughs) Let's say at least for appearances sake, they would have to use their own chain. I don't want to analyze ethos too much. I generally agree with you, but I don't want to go there because that's subjective. Uh, Although I do agree with you. At least for appearances sake, they want to be able to say that it's decentralized. right? Right. So if they would have used something like Liquid or Rootstock, they simply couldn't have said that. So I think Ethereum wouldn't have the success that it had as the sidechain. But you look at something like EOS, which is a federated system, so EOS could have been a side chain of Bitcoin because they don't have this myth of decentralization. They have a 21 node block producers. I mean, the block producers are, they're not constant. The set of block producers. Yeah, they get voted in based on the whales. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It's very similar to Liquid and Rootstock, but it changes. The thing is, I don't think it's a good model. So it's more, I don't see what's the point in it. Because we're looking at this from a decentralized Bitcoin or ethos where we're like, 
I don't know about you, but I'm thinking of this like I don't trust central banks. I don't trust the authorities to make the proper decisions. I want to be able to participate in keeping it decentralized. And that's what I'm fighting for. But for most of these other projects, it's like Justin's son is like the dude that is Tron. And like (laughs) it's not decentralization for the most part. There's some that want decentralization, but the risk of centralization is so much greater and 51% attack and like government just coming in and shutting down these projects is so much bigger on these altcoins than on Bitcoin. So I think like Liquid didn't make their own token. A lot of us were thinking like, why don't these altcoins just build on Bitcoin? So that was kind of like a common theme that I would say, and I know others would say like, just build on Bitcoin. Why are we doing all this stuff? as side coins and altcoins and making these coins. And even Rootstock initially wasn't going to have a token. But then when the ICO boom happened, and then they added the RIF token, which complicated everything. And now you need RSK and RIF or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> it's like you know, yeah. the second layer for ETH has to have its token. Like there's ETH, and then there's the second layer token, and then there's the decentralized exchange token, and then there's the instant messenger token, and like all the projects, the tokens. Yeah, if I had to choose between using Ethereum or RSK, I would choose Ethereum 100% of the time and just use, probably I would use some Bitcoin, some wrapped Bitcoin, you know, trusted wrapped Bitcoin thing, just because Ethereum has actual usage. So why would I ever use RSK? What would you use ETH for? That's the thing. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to use it because you said you want to be in control and so on. That's why you care about those things. The reason I personally care about this is that I want to use services that I can trust won't be stopped and disappear. And you can never be 100% sure about this, but I think the major risk right now to most projects in the space is regulatory risk. I think that some of the centralized exchanges are doing and will continue to do a better job at evading those regulatory risks compared to Ethereum projects, which I believe are, a lot of them are going to succumb to regulators in the next year or two. What do you think the chances of that is? Very high, I would say 80%. I'm pretty sure that, it, I mean, it already happened a lot of times. You mentioned earlier in the conversation, you mentioned IDEX and Etherdella, and both had like major clash-ins with regulators and both completely folded when that happened. So, oh yeah, that's right. IDEX did get rid of their decentralization plan yeah they're centralized they do kyc you know it's and i'm pretty sure that we're gonna see like maker dow i'm sure that they're gonna go there they have no choice basically and i don't trust them to be able to fight back that's a good point i never thought about it like that because any of these decentralization projects end up well not any of them but the ones that become big enough for the regulators to pay attention to that get success they usually have to do KYC or shut down or pay a $250,000 or more fine to the SEC or whatever regulator. But there's a significant amount of projects that just have not been fined yet and can still kind of get by. Yeah, because they're too small for anyone to care. And as long as they stay small, then yeah, but that's not very interesting. The risk is there for sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if some project has like $1 million volume in a year, then no one is going to care. But who cares? If you're going to look at something that people actually use, MakerDAO is for sure big enough and the way it operates, it's just so easy to shut it down and tell them to do what I say or shut it down. So in my opinion, it's bound to happen. Okay. So you think that within the next couple of years, there's a real significant risk of a lot of these Ethereum decentralized projects and not just Ethereum, but any kind of decentralized like quote unquote exchange is going to be attacked on the regulatory front and they're going to have to either comply and then continue operating as a centralized business doing KYC with AML laws and all that, or they're going to shut down and be fined, or the other option is they're just going to try to operate outside of the law. Right. So to be fair, that's a risk that obviously any centralized exchange has as well. But the thing is that you have centralized exchanges built as a business that is purposefully designed to be able to fight back, basically. They're not being intellectually dishonest and saying, oh, we're a decentralized exchange, so (laughs) buy our token. One, they're telling the users the truth. And two, you know, they're building their business to be resistant to this kind of threat. They can't be 100% protected, of course. 
but they license all over the world to try to be able to move if one jurisdiction kicks them out. You know, they actively try to fight this. MakerDAO, I mean, they're not, you know, they're not in the same league. I'm sorry. They don't have the legal department to handle that. They don't have the experience that some of these exchanges have. They just don't have it. So I'm sure that if a country starts pushing, they will have to do what they say. They're not built to withstand that at all. As you've mentioned before in your pro Ethereum Telegram channel, why don't we show the link for that right now so people can join that if they're interested in it? Do you want to put the link up on the audio there? Uh, yeah. So it's t.me slash pro Ethereum alerts. Yeah, just pro Ethereum alerts. No spaces, no nothing. I like it. You've got good content in there. It's entertaining. It's good stuff. And one of the things that you said recently in there was that most of these projects on ETH are just kind of like zombies being kept alive by the VCs that are backing ETH. And they're spending millions of dollars keeping these dev teams afloat. And like you said earlier in the conversation, the majority of the users of these apps are the other developers of Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. So it's consistently adding sell pressure to ETH for these developers to continue working on Ethereum while bleeding the Ethereum Foundation and Joe Lubin's company of their ETH stores. Right. So if I was looking to ever go bullish on ETH, I would look to see major downsizing on both the Ethereum Foundation and Consensus and probably downsizing in their investment expenditure too, because it has to go down. I think they probably understand that it has to go down, but I think you would need to see like a very major round of layoffs, really major and deep to say, okay, now maybe we can start thinking about going long fundamentally, right? The other flip of that coin though, is that they continue to do that and they succeed at fluffing up the usage and activity and getting all this code developed and all these apps developed. And then a couple of them take off or ETH starts to go back up in price just because the market shifts or whatever. Like there is a path to ETH going back up to... Yeah, well, why would that happen to ETH and not any of the other shit coins? Like why not... EOS or Tron or whatever, Tezos, they do a better job at marketing, in my opinion, much better job, actually. They do a better job at getting products that do not focus on research, which is boring for normal human beings. They're not spending so much money on research, which is almost none. EOS and Tron don't spend money on research at all, probably. And I think that's a good thing because this research is useless. For five years, Ethereum has been researching things and selling ETH to fund this, and nothing came out of it so far. So what's the point? I think that no one's going to use any decentralized app on any platform, but if someone's going to do that, then why would be Ethereum and not the more like nimble and fast and also well-funded teams? I think you have a valid point there. It's likely that, I think anyways, this is what my general thesis is on cryptocurrencies, because I'm starting to come around a little bit and be less toxic about other coins. I invested in a bunch of projects and stuff. I always had trouble sleeping at night because I'm like, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist at heart. And I really believe Bitcoin is going to be the winner for money. And I just don't want to have a blind spot on all these other projects because some people make some really good arguments that in a world where blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology exists, why is it just going to be that there's only going to be one coin? And it's just going to be Bitcoin and everything else is going to go to zero and nothing else is going to exist. So I'm hedging my bets that if I'm wrong, that Bitcoin is going to be the winner, then I have exposure to some of these other projects. I don't shill them or anything like that, but I have some and I play around with it sometimes. And I just want to be able to um, benefit from these projects going to the moon if they do. So like I'm 70% Bitcoin and the rest is spread amongst different altcoins. Right. So what I would say, long other altcoins and short ETH. <laughs> and the reason for that is if dApps become a thing that people actually want, I don't see any reason why it would be ETH. I think it's very unlikely to be ETH, like extremely unlikely to be ETH. The distance between ETH and the other ones is pretty small compared to the distance between Ethereum and Bitcoin. So if you think someone's going to become bigger than Bitcoin, then why would it be ETH? Just as easily it could have been EOS or Tron or Ripple or whatever. I don't know. So I would say long the rest of them, short ETH. And then if you're wrong about your thesis that the alts are going to go up, then at least you have your ETH short to hedge. 
And if you're right, then I think it's very likely that Ether is not going to be the one to push farther than the rest. So I think you're pretty good if you do that. Yeah, I think there's an equal chance that ETH goes back to all-time high as the same chance that ETH continues to bleed and <laughs> goes down and down and down and one of the other ones take over. Well, even if it does go back to all-time high, don't the other ones have more of an increase? That's why I'm not holding much ETH at all. I mean, I just have a handful of it just to play around with some games. Like I invested in Blockade Games. They're making this really cool cypherpunk game for Steam and Neon District is what it's called. They're selling stuff on OpenSea. So like I go and I buy clothes and stuff like that for the game on OpenSea. And, you know, I invest in a lot of these projects to try to incentivize and encourage them to come to like build it on Lightning too and like use Bitcoin and stuff. So I'm invested in all these different ethereum projects to try to like influence them to come to bitcoin but so i play around with them sometimes so i don't really invest in eth as i much as i just use eth sometimes and it's been a horrible experience using eth every fifth transaction runs out of gas or there's a nonce error or it's a duplicate transaction or something like that so it's slow it's like i don't like using eth at all they're just bad at it they really are they're, they're not focusing on the important things Again, I do not believe any of these platforms is going to have any meaningful traction ever. But as you said, maybe I'm wrong. So if I'm wrong, then why on earth would it be if they do not focus on any of the important things? They do not focus on user experience as much as the others do. They do not focus on actual apps that make sense as the others do. Like Tron is full of gambling apps. And gambling is what people want, man. Same with the EOS. That's what people want. They want gambling. They don't want to get 2% annual interest on DAI. Who cares? Yeah, I believe that you got the right thought there. When you just think about the average person adopting a blockchain, I just don't think it's going to happen. Unless it's just becomes, you know, like their thesis comes to life and it just becomes that like the biggest companies in the world start to use web 3.0 or whatever and then you just use it where you don't even know you're using it yeah so that's insane (laughs) if that happens then my sister is not gonna buy eth to use her filmmaking app or something like that it's i just don't get the mass adoption thesis for web 3.0 tokens yeah i think it's delusional at this point it's really it's hard for me to see the difference between people pushing Ethereum narratives and people who push Ripple narratives or IOTA narratives or whatever they seem, you know, it's very similar. It's just a bad story. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense. And they seem to be very religious about it at this point. 